Okay, yes. okay, excuse me. Um, so the, uh, the last year was published this well-known article, Lazaridis Ali, in, uh, which, is, uh, which, which appeared in three parts, uh, describing the so-called Southern Arc genetical history. Uh, the conception of Southern Arc includes the following countries, the Turkey, Balkans, the Aegean, Cyprus, Mesopotamia, the Levant, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Iran. So in these three articles are re reported ancient DNA date from 727 individuals over past 11,000 years. Focusing on the Chalcolithic and Bronze Ages, circa 7,000 to 2,000 years ago, when the Indo-European language speakers first appeared. So the main, uh, main stress goes to the problem of Indo-Europeans. And Armenia plays a pretty important role in this history because a very big quantity of data, genetical data, were taken just from Armenian samples. Uh, what are the main results of the research in some words? So according to, the, to this data, steep pastoralists of the Yamna culture, which, which is spreading north of the Armenian highland, north of the Caucasus, they initiated a chain of migrations leaking Europe to the west of China and India in the east. So some people, people uh, across the Balkans, circa 5,000 to 4,000 five years ago, traced almost all the genes to this expansion. Steep migrants soon admixed with locals creating diverse ancestry from which speakers of the Greek, Paleo, Balkan, and Albanian languages arose. And Yamna expansion also crossed the Caucasus. And by circa 4,000 years ago, Armenia had become the enclave of low but pervasive steep ancestry in the West, where the patrilineal descendants of Yamna men virtually extinct to on the steep persisted. The Armenian language was born there, related to Indo-European languages of Europe, such as Greek, by their shared Yamna heritage. Neolithic and Anatolians were descended, descended from both local hunter-gatherers and eastern populations of the Caucasus, Mesopotamia, and the Levant. Earlier forms of Anatolian and non-Anatolian Indo-European languages, such as Hatic and Trian, were likely spoken by migrants and locals part participating in this great mixture. And what is very important here, Anatolia is remarkable for its lack of steep ancestry. The ancestry of the Yamnaya was only partly local, half of it was West Asian, from both the Caucasus and the more southern Anatolian Levantine continuum. Migration into the steep started by circa 7,000 years ago, making the last extension of the Yamna into the Caucasus as a kind of return to the homeland of about half their ancestors. So this, the whole theory says that the most of the Indo-European language family can be derived or at least linked to Yamna pastoralists, genetically similar populations. Mm -hmm. As I already told, Armenia plays a pretty important role in this whole theory, and we have uh, the and is presented as a fluctuating steep ancestry against a persistent West Asian genetic background. The most noticeable feature of the history of Armenia compared with all other. Asian region of the Southern Arc is the tentative appearance of Eastern hunter ancestry, so the Yamnaya people, in Armenia already 7,000 years ago, followed, this is the Halkortic period, followed by its disappearance 5,000 uh, 5, 
thousand years ago with the appearance of the early Bronze Age Uraraxas culture and its reappearance at the Middle Bronze Age. It means the end of the third millennium before Christ, when a level of 14 percent was followed by 10 percent in the late bronze age and iron age and then diluted to seven age by the Ura period of the first half of the first millennium bc and to the one person to three percent levels observed since the second half of that millennium through the medieval period down to pre present armenians and we compare the middle and late Bronze Age individuals. This is in common the second millennium BC with other West Asian, European and steep population. It is evident that Armenia is an outlier, a kind of an enclave of steep influence in West Asia. The mid third millennium BC corresponds to the dem demise of the Kura Araxas culture and its succession by the early Kurgan culture, so this is the beginning of the Middle Bronze Age, followed during the end of that millennium by the Trialet Ivanadzor complex from which an individual from Tafshut already has the 10 Eastern hunter gatherer ancestry of the Lejash and Metzamor population. Lejash and Metzamor is the name of the cultural unit of uh, of Armenia during the late bronze and early Iron age it means the half first uh, the mid of the second millennium mid of the first millennium BC the first documented steep descendant in Armenia to millennia after the Chalcolithic period so the Yamna patrilini survived in Armenia down to present day where this clay is present in, a, in appreciable frequencies in all studied Armenian groups. The interpretation of Urartu is also interesting. The uh, authors divide the Urartu into two main geographical clusters the Van cluster and the so-called Armenian cluster. We could call them Yerevan cluster. The Van cluster is in continuity with the pre-Urartian population and is characterized by more Levantine ancestry and the absence of steep ancestry. And the people were speaking the so-called Urartian language, which is not an Urartian uh, language family, uh, excuse me, Indo-European. And the second is the Armenian cluster uh, uh, of Urartan period individuals who had less Latin and some steep ancestry like the pre-Urartan individual, individuals of the early Iron Age, so the Indo-Europeans. According to the authors, the the these articles this work creates a new paradigm the, the the authors write on the basis of these results the authors suggest that earlier reliance on modern phenotypes and ancient writings and artistic depictions provided an inaccurate picture of early indo-europeans and they provide a revised history of the complex migrations and populations population integrations that shaped these cultures. As an archeologist, uh, I see, I have some questions and also I see some problems in this very interesting theory. So first of all, the terminology. Through the whole article goes the idea of Anatolia or Anatolians, a conception which appeared just hundred years ago. Arsen, you muted yourself Mute. again somehow. Mute we can't hear you. Uh, the, can you. Can you? Yeah, now, now we can hear you. Oh. You could. You should Just go back. Moment. To the idea. Mm -hmm. So, uh, some some problems 
important questions uh, concerning the article. First of all, terminology. We need to understand well some terminological details, like, for example, Anatolia, what we understand on, on, on the Anatolia. Anatolia is a term which appeared just 100 years ago, and many, many things are mixed into the concept of Anatolia, which is very essentially uh, divided and should be considered in their details. Uh, or the Caucasus, the authors speak mostly about Southern Caucasus using the Caucasus on the whole. And also, the, our, when we are saying Armenia, we understand only the modern Armenian. From archaeological point of view, it's uh, we, the archaeologists call the problem the pots and peoples. This is the independence of material culture uh, from from the ethnic problems, the, from the problems of language, like, for example, as an archaeologist, I don't see any, any reflection of Yamna or steep cultural traits in Armenia in that very period, although we have some smaller reflections. Identity and genes, these are totally different questions. The, they are independent categories. For example, the, the authors bring also the example of modern Turkey, in which only 9% of genes uh, of the people living in Turkey are coming from the Western, from the Turkish fatherland in the Altai region of Siberia, but the identity is totally different. The elite and the people, the aspects, social aspects, for example, when the authors speak about Urartu, and they bring very often the example of Karmir Balur, the excavation of Karmir Balur materials which were used actually have nothing to do with the, with Urartu. They represent the local population of Iron Age, but the, they are accepted in the article as Urartians. Details concerning for lo, about local cultures like Halkolithic, Middle Bronze Age similarities, Middle Bronze Age diversity, Urartu as a state assemblage, these are details which should be essentially considered during uh, a pre presentation of such problems. Dynamics of steep and lowland relations. Here we should also archaeological st archaeologically stress the absence of materiality. For example, Scythians, Mongols, and other steep people which are present in the Near East and uh, Armenian highland They do not let uh, material cultural uh, rests. Then comparisons between Armenians of modern Armenia and Eastern Turkey could be a very important point. For example, most of Armenians of modern Armenia are from Eastern Turkey, but they are taken as a background to represent the Armenia, the Eastern Armenia actually. Inclusion of data of Kurds, Assyrians, and other people from Turkey would be very important to uh, further demonstrate the cultural variety of Turkey, of Anatolia, as they call. Problems of known ethnic movements. I br bring here, for example, two only examples, like the Hatti or Supa people appeared in Ararat Wali in the 8th century, or Shah Abbas took the uh, whole population of Eastern Armenia to Iran, and then only one part came back, and big mi mixes of populations took place during the last 100, or uh, just during the last 400 years, or inclusion of linguists and problems concerning linguistics would be very important uh, or in understanding of these questions in, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, interdisciplinary sense. Importance of language for identity building could be very important um, uh, in, uh, in understanding of such questions. And 
just uh, uh, from archaeological, uh, excuse me. And uh, I would like uh, to cite the authors, uh, very important ideas, these two ideas in contrast to findings about movements of people, the relevance of genetics to debate about language origins is more indirect because languages can be replaced with little or no genetic change and populations can migrate and mix with little or no linguistic change. Nevertheless, the detection of migration is important because it identifies a plausible vector for language change. And then another important idea, nonetheless, it complements ancient texts and evidence from archaeology. By using genetic data, we can hope to obtain a more nuanced impression of past processes, especially with regards to movements of people and biological phenotypes than would be possible without such data. Here you see um, a photo which, which I like very much, which I made in 2002 as I visited uh, Musa Ler. Uh, and uh, from, uh, from the point of archaeologists looking on this picture, church is Armenian, artifact is Turkish, people, people living around our Alevis, and when the archeologist will excavate this context, what can he reconstruct from, from these things? Just, I want to bring an approach of an archeologist in losing, in losing of such questions, which are very much uh, difficult from archeological point. And if I may only, I shall bring uh, during one minute, two examples from our excavations demonstrating uh, some important points of this article. Uh, both examples are from our excavations. First of them, this is the well-known phenomenon of V-shop stones. Uh, these uh, important monuments, which are typical uh, merely for the Armenian highland. And now during last, last, 10 years we are excavating in a site which is called which is on the southern southern slopes of the mount aragats the site is called garmishsar or Tirinkatar. here we have 12 uh, bishops dragon stones and the question we have if we date them to chalcolithic or middle bronze age one interesting thing most of the C14 data, radiocarbon data we have, and we have some 50 until now, go either to Chalcolithic or to Middle Bronze Age. And we have a lack, uh, gap in between, gap of the Middle Bronze Age, which is, uh, excuse me, of Early Bronze Age, which is demonstrated also by genetical data. I want only to show that similarity of Chalcolithic or Middle Bronze Age, which we have as archeologists in one, in interpreting one phenomena and the geneticians in other phenomena. And another one, once again, concerning the Early Bronze Age and Middle Bronze Age, uh, we have this gap of, uh, of Eastern stock during the, Early Bronze Age, it means the mid of the fourth millennium, mid of the third millennium. And you see here one archeological site in Artanish Eastern shores of Sevan Lake. And the situation in Hul Armenia is the same. We have 99% of archeological material belonging to the Early Bronze Age Ura Araxes culture. And as a rule, at the uh, at some points at the end of the Kurarax uh, of early Bronze Age, beginning of the Middle Bronze Age, materials are appearing belonging to the so-called Urgan culture, dating to the 24th, 23rd centuries BC, which are very rare. They are making only one 
or two percent in the common archaeological context and they could belong to the to the to the to some kind of um, influences of steep people this just two examples demonstrating that we can find uh, ties between archaeological data and um, data coming from genetics. Uh, this is just what I wanted to say. I hope you will have questions. Of course, many things I could uh, reflect in details. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Arsen. Um, so just to, to clear things up, uh, so you, you presented the, the papers by Lazaridis. This is the main reason why we are meeting here to, to, to talk about uh, these two papers and uh, what, what they imply. Uh, but in your list of uh, questions uh, and, and where you, 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 you put in question uh, many of the terminology they use, methods, etc., I'm a little bit confused then. Do you think uh, that, uh, I mean, uh, do you think that uh, uh, their conclusions uh, are, um, are not correct? Or do you think that uh, they, they need to be uh, studied further and we need to find more evidence like what you're showing on the screen right now in the archaeological uh, no. record? So, uh, so, so what, do, what is uh, your point of view? Uh, uh, no, I I think I think that the uh, theory under consideration is very very interesting, but in many questions, as an archaeologist, we we need a lot of backgrounds to bring all these data together and show so it's um, uh, that the genetics and archaeology can work together. Because, for example, if we are saying that the Yamna culture, Yamna culture, or Yamna people uh, uh, brought this, uh, brought these old genes, we should also have their archaeological reflections. As an archaeologist, I do not see the presence of Yamna culture in Armenia. How can I reflect about it? So this is merely genetical approach, but the archaeological approach is a little bit different than the, than the genetical. I want only to say that we need to combine all possible data together to have more or less a common picture on the theory. Okay, so, so you think that it's very important uh, to have interdisciplinary studies uh so different uh, of course of course is key to understanding origins of ethnicity and languages then for you and of course bringing the the linguists into the discussion as i know in the in this whole uh, hundreds of um, authors we have no linguists or perhaps uh, we have i do not know but mostly we are dealing with archaeologists uh, uh, and uh, less linguists. For example, the, it would be also interesting to know that the approaches of the linguists, they have also their way of chronologies, a lot of chronology and different other things, which could be very interesting in considering these questions. Okay, could, could, uh, could perhaps the reason why you don't find a trace uh, of in the archaeological record of the um, this movement of steppe people uh, into the Armenian region, uh, could it be because uh, it was possibly an elite? Can you can you talk about uh, how sometimes you have elites mm -hmm. who are the rulers and who genetically do not necessarily represent um, the same? Uh, they they might speak a different language or be genetically different than the vast majority of the people who are living under their rule. Could that be the, an explanation, perhaps? Okay, it can be an explanation because we have, uh, as I already mentioned, we have many, uh, many 
reflections of the presence of the steep peep in the Armenian highland, in the Caucasus, in the Near East during uh, since, the, since the Bronze Age. And the, their reflections are not only Indo-European speaking peoples, also Mongols, Turkey, Turkish, Turkic peoples who appeared in the Near East and our region during the last thousand years. But we have no essential reflections of their material culture in Armenia. For example, if we take, take Mongols, what we have in Armenia, only some kind of some um, graves, some mausoleums of, of the elite. And uh, uh, the material culture as itself is, is absent. And this is one of the interesting traits of, uh, of steep cultures. Very often, they could be present in different ways, however absent materially. And this is a, a little bit a theoretical question, okay. how it appears. Okay, interesting. And do you think that uh, there's new archaeological methods that can be used to resolve this, the questions of ethnicity? I mean, is the field of archaeology, uh, are there, is it working no. in different ways? Is there new techniques that are being used? Uh, you know, this, uh, it is very uh, important that we are, are living now in a new period um, in which the ethnic problems appearing again, because after the, so before the First World War, there was a, the widespread, they were widespread ideas about movement of peoples. After the Second World War, we, there was a there was a period of silence about such questions, especially in Western world. The ethnicity and archaeology were something which were not uh, combined together. Uh, and in recent years, in recent 20 years, with appearance of genetical new studies, the question of ethnicity, of material culture are appearing again in discussion. And these discussions could be very much interesting if we bring the data from different branches into the, into the context and uh, trying to see, for example, the archaeological data, the genetical data, anthropology compared to each other, and how can we lose questions interdisciplinarily? Okay, good. Uh, maybe maybe one more question uh, from myself as a moderator uh, for you. Uh, um, uh, what are the focal inflection points that you see in the prehistory of Armenia that change the course of, of our history and be, can, can be connected to genetic data? I mean, this uh, step... Uh, um, uh, this, this is the, uh, just, I, as I mentioned in the last slide, the end of the third millennium. Yes. The 24th. 25th, 24th century, the end of the fifth millennium is the biggest change in the whole history of beginning from the Neolithic uh, period, according to my point of view, because the change which took place after the disappearance of Uraraxas culture, appearance of this Middle Bronze Age, the so-called Urgan cultures and other Middle Bronze Age cultures, it really changed the whole uh, cultural cont uh, in in Armenia, and just this point is really reflect is reflected in genetical studies. And this is very important. But uh, does, it, and, does, uh, does this point that you're talking about does this correspond to the uh, yeah. to the time where Armenians? This is this is, this is correspondent. Yeah, could be for that, yeah, this is talk. this is correspondent. Yeah. Uh, uh, this 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 is really corresponding to the theory uh, that some kind of new people also could be peered in the territory 
and they are also archaeologically we we have also the archaeological reflection of this event and the but i do not see for example the question is big dif difference big difference in urartian period as the article demonstrates as if we have urartu around one urartu around yerevan and they are totally different this is not the case because archaeologically when we are going to the early iron age before urartu this is the same cultural situation around one or around uh, yerevan And then Urartu appears as a kind of administration and state assemblage. And this is what you already mentioned about the, uh, the elite. This is an administration and elite going from one place to another place, bringing a Mesopotamian way of life into, our, into, into the country. And essentially, it is not an ethnic problem in itself not a problem of language of but the administration so also so in western literature it is well defined as a urarto as a state assemblage more than an ethnic ethnic problem in itself okay uh thank you very much arsen thank you and um, a question please the, the questions will be afterwards, if you don't mind, uh, because we will let the other panelists speak and then we can gather any questions you have. And it's, please send them uh, in writing instead of uh, um, uh, speaking the questions, if you don't mind. And then I'll, I'll relay the questions to the, the person that you want to ask them to after Christine and Armin have finished. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, so Christine, uh, Christine, Dr. Christine Martirosian Olshansky um, has a doctorate uh, in, uh, from the UCLA. She's an archaeologist um, like Arsene. Um, she works uh, at the Kotzen Institute of Archaeology in UCLA, uh, where she directs the research program of Armenian archaeology and ethnography. She's currently in Armenia on the Massis Bleu, um excavation site that was mentioned uh, previously so she's been conducting field work in armenia since 2008 and uh, she's collaborated and uh, on and co-directed co a range of projects spanning from the neolithic to the late bronze, bronze age in the region and um so uh, massis blur is a very interesting neolithic settlement that she's working on it's an 8,000 year old early far farming community located in the Ararat Plain. And it's been, it was occupied for almost 1,000 years uh, straight. So uh, she's uh, doing a lot of digs there. And this area was mentioned uh, in, uh, in the paper and uh, in a lot of archaeological um, journals also. So, uh, Christine, the floor is yours. You can put up your presentation. Um, if, um, you can. I'm going to start sharing my presentation. Let me know when you can see it. Are you able to see the presentation? Yes, right now. Great. Um, well, as Peter mentioned, I will be talking about the genetic evidence of, of, for the first farmers of the Armenian highlands, but with a focus on the Ararat Valley. Um, with that, and Arsene gave us a really nice summary of the three papers. My focus will be on the third paper called Ancient DNA from Mesopotamia, suggests this um, distinct pre-pottery and pottery Neolithic migrations into Anatolia. Um, so I won't give you much of a summary, but I'll highlight just a few points later. But to ground us in time and space, um, for those of us who are not archaeologists and are not familiar with archaeological jargon and the time spans, um, here's a map um, on the right hand side of um, the Armenian high part of the Armenian highlands and parts of um, the southern Caucasus. 
um, as well as a very simplified chronology of the early Holocene and what was going on at that time in terms of domestication of animals, um, domestication of uh, various cereals, invention of pottery, etc. Um, the period I will be talking about, like the pre-pottery Neolithic, Neolithic, and the uh, Calcolithic periods, um, are based on these names are based on accumulated changes in behaviors and technologies that we can identify in the archeological record. Um, there's a lot of variation in when and how these things happened across the world, but even within just the Near East in general. So for example, the domestication of um, animals and plants and the beginning of the first farming societies um, did not happen at the same time um, in Anatolia, in central Turkey um, versus the Southern Caucasus or the Mesopotamia and the Levant. Uh, it's an, sort of an important point to keep in mind as we talk about the Neolithic period. It often, it can come across as it was just this one big thing that happened across the map simultaneously and we know that that was not the case. Um, uh, so for the late Neolithic settlements in the Ararat uh, Valley particularly, uh, and the Southern Caucasus in general, so, um, scholars uh, looking at the same material assemblages um, in the 50s, 60s, and later on, um, particularly at similarities with assemblages found in Mesopotamia have argued that this was a result of cultural contact and borrowing of ideas or that the, and here I quote, uh, they represent something intrusive from further south of the Ararat plain consisting of small colonies of early food producers who lived in the area for several centuries before returning to their southern homelands and or possibly assimilating with the local highlanders and disappearing from the archeological record. Um, so what does the genetic data show us? And the two, the th the two um, samples coming from the Arab Valley from the Neolithic period, um, are the first and only ancient DNA that's been analyzed so far. And in general, Neolithic period burials are very rare. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of data to submit for ancient DNA analysis to begin with. But what, um, um, <clears throat> what they, what, oh, pardon me, what Lazaridis and co-authors um, have shown and through the analysis of the ADNA is that the one sample submitted from Akhnashen date, that dates to around 5900 BC has a very strong um, Caucasian hunter-gatherer signature in the DNA, and the sample uh, submitted from Masis Blur that dates to 5600 BCE um, has both uh, Caucasian hunter-gatherer and Anatolian uh, Levantine ancestry. Um, and Arsene has already mentioned the issues with uh, the terminology of Anatolia and Anatolian and how these are defined and where the boundaries and borders of these things are and who are really Anatoli the Anatolians um, that the authors refer to. Um, uh, but um, uh, it, in any case, in the last decade or so, ancient DNA analysis has been used to supplement our understanding of how the Neolithization processes, so how the adoption of farming um, took place in various parts of Southwest Asia. Uh, and throughout the region, archaeological evidence uh, for the movement of people, materials, or ideas is well documented. In the Southern Caucasus during the late Neolithic, um, archaeological research indicates relations with Northern Mesopotamia, particularly with the uh, Halaf and Samara cultures, um, uh, but as well as settlements in central Turkey, Neolithic settlements in central Turkey. So one of the major questions that we try to answer is what is moving, right? Is it a movement of people, movement of material culture only? So are they just trading the material cultures or is it a movement of ideas? Um, or what is more likely to be um, a combination of all of these things, right? Um, and not just something singular. 
the ADNA from the two Neolithic sites, Agnashan and Masisplur, has shown that the individuals from, like I said, Agnashan has a um, Caucasian together signature and Masisplur has a mix, um, which again shows variation, that things don't happen in singular ways and within a very, Agnashan and uh, Masisplur are maybe 10 kilometers apart. And these are two settlements that, even though the the burials date, the individuals date to um, different time periods. They are three hundred years apart, but the settlements in the Arad Plain were established at about the same time, around six thousand BC, maybe a little earlier, and they were occupied continuously for about the same length of time. And material, culture-wise, for all practical purposes, they're identical. Um, so there are just two sister villages that set up around the same time and went out um, about the same time. Um, um, but the, so the variation is only in the in the in the genetic data. Um, but again, there is we can say unlike for the Bronze Age when we have multitude of samples right from the different uh, periods of the Bronze Age, um, the Middle Bronze, the Late Bronze, and the Iron Age. Um, we only have two from all of the Neolithic that lasted for about a thousand years from two different sites in the Ararat Valley. Um, so we can't really say a whole lot about what was going on other than, you know, people at some point, people from more Anatolian and Levantine um, admixture came into the Ararat Valley. Um, and mixed in with the local population. Um, which is, which just provides additional line of evidence for, as I said, what we've been seeing um, uh, in terms of the archaeological record, because we have certain material assemblages that we can identify to those parts of Southeast Asia that appear in the Arad Plain. Um, to just bring out just uh, a few quotes like in way of a summary from the article, I will repeat what Lazaridis and co-authors wrote, which seems to be, let me just move my Zoom screen so I can see the quotes. In comparison to the ind individuals from Mesopotamia to the south, the individuals from Armenia and Azerbaijan had more Anatolian Neolithic admixture. Conversely, some Neolithic Anatolian populations from central Anatolia had Caucasus hunter-gatherer-related admixture. More than Pinarbashi, and that's a northwestern Ana Turkish site, and most were the north, oh, excuse me, northwestern Anatolian populations. Uh, the local Caucasus hunter-gatherer-related ancestry, his global meaning in, the, in Armenia, has always been the most important component of, of the population from the Neolithic to the present making up 50 to 70 percent of ancestry over the past 8,000 years. Um, and this uh, continuity, um, uh, the strong genetic continuity in, uh, in the Arad Plain is um, uh, quite significant. Uh, now let me bring you guys back up so I can see everyone. Um, all right. Uh, and that, in essence, is a very brief summary, um, but the, the important points of um, the results of the ancient DNA analysis from the Neolithic sites in the Arad Plain. I don't know if I can add much in terms of the paper, but I'm happy to entertain questions. Um, and thank you for your attention. Peter, you're muted. Well, I was muted. Yeah. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, so I'll be asking you some questions as moderator, and then we'll take questions from uh, the people attending this um, this discussion. So uh, if you can write these on the meeting chat, uh, I will ask them after we have finished the, all three of the presentations. Um, uh, before I ask you some questions, I wanted to say that, uh, of course, uh, um, when when we started the Armenian DNA project, we were basically testing living Armenians, and uh, we didn't have access at the time for uh, to ancient uh, DNA. 
Uh, so we, we could only see the picture of what people living everywhere of Armenian descent uh, was giving, giving us. And the beauty of the last 10 years is that uh, we've had uh, uh, a lot of ancient DNA uh, data coming in at, at different uh, periods in time and then comparing them to populations in, in much broader areas. And it's absolutely fascinating uh, to me and to everybody who's interested in the field to be able to, to, to see, for example, these two skeletons 6,000 years ago and um, basically see what their genetic makeup is and compare it to ours and, and other populations. So this is just the tip of the iceberg. There will be many, many more... Uh, samples analyzed, and I'm sure at one point in time we'll have 50 or 100 uh, Neolithic uh, uh, samples from Armenia, so uh, from the Armenian region, let's put it this way. Um, so uh, it'll be very interesting to see what, what uh, comes out of it. Um, so uh, this leads me to asking you of your opinion of uh, uh, how significant uh, this, the result of ADNA analysis is uh, of, of Neolithic samples. I mean, I'm sure you're looking forward to more of uh, such samples in the future. Are you coming across more skeletons in your dig? Unfortunately not. And that's one of the main, well, that's one of the main reasons we only have two samples because from the three Neolithic sites in the Arab plain that have been excavated uh, in the last 20 plus years, um, we've only come across three burials. Um, we, these are long, for the Neolithic period, relatively large settlements. Um, they uh, are not ephemeral by any, uh, any sense. They, and they were occupied for quite extensive periods, all three of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Yet the burials are, are missing. We don't know where they were, they were burying their dead. Um, so we only have we only have the two from in situ context at Masis Blur, and I know this to be true for our sister site as well, Aknashen and Aratashen, they've come across human remains um, that could potentially date to the Neolithic period, but these are not uh, proper burials that are in situ. These are burials that have been disturbed either by later intrusive occupation or intrusive um, sort of activities at the site dating to the Bronze Age, maybe the medieval period and even modern times. Um, uh, but by and large, we don't have as many burials. And that's true not only for Armenia, that's also true for Neolithic sites in Georgia and Azerbaijan, uh, yeah. which are a material assemblage and material culture. So I can, it would be very optimistic thinking that we might have more. Um, I mean, it would be fantastic if we got 50, but I'd be happy with 10. Okay. Um, is there any evidence that they were burning the dead, uh, maybe? Is that uh, or we don't have any evidence of cremation. No. Uh, and not only from uh, the Southern Caucasus, but also we don't have a whole lot of evidence for cremation from, um, from you know, um, Turkey, from modern day Turkey or um, the neighboring regions of sort of Zagros or the Mesop or Mesopotamia. Okay. That's an interesting uh, puzzle. Maybe there were large cemeteries outside the areas of the digs. So let's hope we come across one of them. Um, it's possible. Do you have any uh, other lines of evidence on how farming was established uh, in the region? The short answer is no. <laughs> um, there is, a, a, although there are some there's some research happening right now that hopefully will answer, um, answer that question uh, in a more positive way. But for right now, there seems to be a, a significant hiatus between the end of the Paleolithic period, sort of the end of the hunter-gatherer societies in, in the region, and the establishment of farming communities, which happens at 6000 BC, and it seems seems like overnight all of these well-established farming communities spring up um, across the southern Caucasus, so in, in Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan, um, with a full domesticated package. So the period that we have from what's called the Fertile Crescent 
uh, right in, uh, in, in, in the Levant and in Mesopotamia, when we can see people are beginning to domesticate sheep and goat and, uh, and certain plants that leave phenotypical markers both on the plants and on the animals. Um, we don't have that in Armenia. Uh, so it seems like farming some some Soviet scholars uh, in the 50s and 60s, and I think even maybe a little earlier, had argued for a local uh, option of farming or a local invention of farming, rather, based on the fact that the Ca Southern Caucasus in general is so rich with a lot of the wild variants of the plants and animals that were first domesticated. Um, like the sheep and the goat and barley and uh, wheat, some of those uh, plants uh, are endemic to the region. But we're just, we don't have any archaeological evidence for that. So the, um, it seems that farming arrived in Armenia or in, in the Southern Caucasus as an idea and possibly if we take that singular a DNA evidence from Massis Bloor, um, along with the people, not just the idea and the technology of farming, but also with populations who had started to move out. Um, and that's a likely scenario also because first farming communities here date back to 6000 BC, whereas we know in Levant and um, Anatol like in central Turkey, um, they're older. Um, okay. The late Neolithic sites are by a thousand years um, older. And then, of course, the pre pottery Neolithic uh, period is much older. Okay, it's interesting. So, this is a good example of uh, genetics uh, shedding some light on a link which you don't really see on the archaeological record. And, and maybe if this person who has some Anatolian Levantine genetic uh, background, um, wanted to be buried the way he was buried uh, back home and that's why we found him uh, the, the, in the burial site maybe the the, the local inhabitants had different burial practices it's interesting that you should say that because the Massis Blur burial is definitely an outlier the vast majority of Neolithic burials we have from all of the Near East are in this fetal crouched position buried on their side. And um, if I go back to the my slide, as you can see, our individual who was a male in his 30s is buried in a supine position. So like stretched out on his back, which is not typical of Neolithic burials in the region at all. Um, so that's another mystery for uh, for another decade, probably. I don't think that's one we'll be able to answer. Um, okay, good. So that was like to my to my last question: uh, How can you tell when when something in the archaeological uh, record is a local feature and when it is not? But this is a good example um, in this particular burial. Uh, it is. It is an interesting example. Yes. Uh, so there are multiple multiple ways for us to tell what is local and what is non-local. And mostly it's based on comparison with our existing data, data set, right? Our existing knowledge. And tomorrow we might discover, another site might be discovered that might be revolutionary that offer a new paradigm of how this things. But for now, we what we do is technotypological analysis. So we compare things um, across sites, across regions, and we know that certain things like the, um, for example, I think a, a phenomenon that more of our audience is going to be familiar with, the Kura Araxis phenomenon that um, emerged here um, and spread out. And the pottery, this, the same exact pottery with the same um, decorations we see in, uh, it went as far as um, Israel and Arsen can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but the Kuraraxis phenomenon spreading as far as Israel into the modern territories of Israel, right? This highly burnished black ware that's called the Kuraraxis ware here appears there, and they call it the Kirbet Karak ware just because that was the first site where the pottery was found. Um, 
again, this is not my time period and Arsene can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but uh, sort of a comparison of the material assemblage, like pottery we have in at, at the Neolithic sites of the Southern Caucasus pottery fragments that are called halaf pottery. And this is a tradition that um, originated in Mesopotamia. It's a pottery style that was established there. And over time, either by itself or with people, it just moved into um, the Caucasus. And conversely, from uh, my own um, research, and I also within the Neolithic archaeology, I focus on stone tools. So I've analyzed a lot of obsidian, trying to source the origin of the obsidian artifacts we've found at Masis Plur. And while the vast majority of them do source to local obsidian sources here in uh, modern day Armenia, some of them come uh, naturally from um, the Armenian highland in general, what's today Eastern Turkey. But I also have um, quite a few samples that come from modern day central Turkey from uh, from Nemrut Dah and the Bingo sources. Um, and they, central Turkish Neolithic sites such as um, Domustepe have Armenian obsidian, or obsidian from the Arteni source that appears in their assemblages. Um, so we know that material was moving um, across our modern borders. And uh, sometimes it might be hard to just like erase these borders in our minds as we're talking about these things, but you know, these border borders did not exist. And um, people were moving and migrating and meeting and exchanging goods or and exchanging ideas and exchanging likely um, sort of sons and daughters and finding themselves new marriage partners um, across this vast landscape. All right, thank you very much, Christine. Very interesting. And good luck with your continued digs. Thank you. All right. So um, now we switch over to uh, Dr. Aram Yardumian. So an anthropologist, uh, uh, unlike the two previous two panelists who are archeologists, uh, he has a doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. And he's currently working on a large scale genomic uh, survey of uh, Georgia. Um, his primary interest in his work uh, is to shed light on the population histories of this complex region, especially the impact of upper Paleo Paleolithic and Neolithic settlers in the region, as well as the interactions between Caucasus populations and those of Anatolia, Iran, and the Mediterranean region. So it's fairly large. So um, Aram, the floor is yours. You can put up your presentation. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, quick caveat. There's a huge thunderstorm over my house right now. So if you hear uh, crashing or if I disappear, it's not because I don't want to be here. My lights have already flickered once. So uh, thanks to Hagop uh, for organizing this panel discussion and to Peter for leading it. Um, I am going to be picking up on some things that Arson um introduced and i'm actually going to begin let me see if i can get back to the zoom here just want to make sure that okay can you see the are you we, seeing my, my screen or or just the presentation my whole we're seeing, we're seeing your screen no we're you are seeing the whole uh all of the different ones on the side the we're seeing slide six actually but we see so you're not in presentation mode you have to go yeah. to the bottom to put it into presentation mode so that we have only uh, one screen showing instead okay, of that would be advisable. Um, so it's the it's the little uh, on the left at the bottom. It's at the bottom. It's next. right next to the minus. Right. It's this it looks no further down. Yeah. If you go down at the very bottom to the right. Yeah. To the right. Yeah, uh, this, no, no, further, one, no, two, no, four, yeah, one more, that's oh, it. Okay. No, click on it. Okay. No. There we Violet. go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. And I need to cancel that. All right, so I wanted to begin by talking about, um, actually, I think I'm in the wrong, 
There we go. Okay. I want to begin with this curious thing that Eric Hamp said as far back as 1976, linguist, uh, a, a Indo-European linguist. In a in a presentation that he made, he's making a claim for the possibility of a time approaching when we should be speaking of Helleno-Armenian as a single uh, proto-language. So what did he mean when he said that? It's possible to think that what he meant was just yet another reference to the Armenian language co-evolving with Greek in the Balkans, but he actually meant something much more intriguing than that. This is This map comes from J.P. Mallory's book, which suggested that Armenian Greek, along with Phrygian and Thracian, had all evolved in the Balkans or in southeastern Europe, and Armenian had somehow made its way all the way across the Anatolian subcontinent into the Caucasus. I don't think I'm the only one who felt like a, a little bit unconvinced by this very long-term migration, even though there was some textual evidence to support it. What Eric Hamp is saying instead is that he's pointing to the, to the region of the steppe northeast of the Black Sea and suggesting that Armenian and Greek um, co-evolved there and moved in some way into their present positions by circumnavigating the Black Sea I think he means, he's not ever, never quite clear about this, but I think he means clockwise around the Black Sea and not counterclockwise. And this is the first time in the literature I'm aware that someone is saying this. That's to say that Armenian and Greek have evolved north of the North Caucasus in the area which is you know, now exploding and moved south through um, you know, along the shores of the the western, the eastern shore of the Black Sea, which is possible to do, into and into ancient Anatolia, and then you know gradually moving into their present positions. So the question is, how does the Southern Ark paper support this idea? <clears throat> and mind you, no one who's working on the Southern Ark paper was referring to Eric Hamp. This is just these are independent streams of scholarship. So as Arson said, um, we, we had 727 previously unpublished ancient individuals from all over the Southern Arc region. And one of the main conclusions is that <clears throat> Anatolian, Anatolian Indo-European languages, which are the first recorded forms of Indo-European, meaning the first to have epigraphic or textual evidence to support their existence, that they themselves probably did not evolve on the steppe, but in somewhere in somewhere in, in Anatolia. Or if you look carefully at what the at the map in the Southern Arc papers, um, the Southern Caucasus is also a possible homeland for these in Anatolian Indo-European languages. And the reason that, as Arson said, the reason that that they can say this confidently is because. The bronze, uh, the earliest known, and as well as numerous Bronze Age um, samples from these regions don't contain a whole lot of steppe ancestry until later. So, and it's also, it's also, in a, you know, if, if we dig down into the supplement, so there's the, the conclusions in these in these three massive papers by Lazaridis et al. But if you dig down into the supplementary materials, there are also some interesting patterns and trends that um, aren't visible if you just read the conclusions. And then one of them that I find interesting is that if you arrange all of the ancient samples in chronological order, you'll see this pattern wherein step ancestry, genomic step ancestry, meaning um, what we call EHG, European hunter-gatherer, appears in calcolithic samples from Areni 1, the Areni 1 cave, then disappears for a while, then reappears in the Middle Bronze Age, associated, associated with Kura, um, Araxis burial contexts, and, um, and then 
during the Urartian period begins to wind down again. So this is just from a genomic point of view. If we're looking at it from a haploid genetic point of view, that is to say we're talking about um, mit mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome haplogroups, haplogroup R1b makes a rather sudden appearance during the Middle Bronze Age and continues to be present in and is quite um, and is a it forms a significant portion of Armenian uh, population today, as well as Georgian and presumably Azerbaijani, but I don't know. And um, also G2A, which is a significant Y chromosome haplogroup GTA, which is a significant significant portion of um, Armenians now isn't there until the Iron Age. So things are changing. And um, I think Arson makes a good point that we don't necessarily need to say that it's the Yamnaya per se who are um, piercing the Caucasus Mountains and settling. The steppe is a gigantic place. And there are there were surely multitude uh, peoples living in it, doing different things, speaking different languages. Um, in fact, the way that we know that the Proto-Indo-European was, was spoken on the steppe, first and foremost, is because of its relationship to Uralic languages, meaning the languages that are now in the Uralic family, like Finnish, Estonian, Hungarian, but also languages from the Russian steppe, like Mordvinian, um, ancient Uralic languages, and ancient and Proto-Indo-European shared a fair amount of morphology and lexicon. So we don't necessarily need to think of the Omnia people per se, but if we're going to think about steppe peoples moving down into the Caucasus, we should also, we should remember the Mitanni inscriptions um, from 1600 BCE who called upon Mitra and Varuna who are now considered to be Hindu deities, and this is the this is a you know the the Matani um, a Matani official calling upon these deities to um, to stand as witnesses to some kind of agreement. So perhaps if you know if if the Omnia or some related group had something to do with the peopling of the Caucasus, it seems like they brought something that um, similarly ended up in India. And you can see it here. Yamnaya and or other related groups have had a huge impact on the almost the entire continent of Eurasia. You can see in the in the, the pies here that Yamnaya or associated steppe ancestry um, is moving moving westward into the uh, European subcontinent. Half of the British Isles has Yamnaya related ancestry about, you know, what is that? A little less than a quarter of um, Portuguese and Spanish share it. And moving into Kazakhstan and, and down into India, you see the same pattern. So this is a paper from 2019 that precedes the Southern Arc papers. So it doesn't have the same advantage of understanding what we do now about um, the same ancestry moving south through the Caucasus. So the site that I worked with the archaeologists, um, uh, Levon Agikyan and Ruben Badalyan, um, we sent numerous human remains, Bronze Age human remains from the site Karnut, which is in the Chirac area, to the to Harvard Medical School. And I was involved with the analysis of these. You can see that already in the Bronze Age, mitochondrial haplogroups are quite diverse. That's actually not that surprising. What's interesting is the single Y chromosome haplogroup that was yielded by all these samples, I2C. Haplogroup I2 in general is found, guess what? Where? All over the step, all, all over the step. And it seems to have its epicenter in part of Ukraine, central Ukraine. You also see it in, um, parts of Eastern Europe now, 
but it's more recent. Whereas as its distribution in, in um, the Caucasus and even a little bit in Northern Iraq and Iran is very diffuse. So that in itself is an indication that someone is moving south. And Arsene talked quite a bit about this um, Rortian business, but I just had this slide in here so that we could we could see um, uh, reaffirm this idea that steppe ancestry um, was variegated in the in the Urartian region, and that, that's to say that some some Urartian burials have quite a bit of EHG European hunter gatherer, and some have very little, and that's also the case in, as Christine said, in the Neolithic, the few new Neolithic samples that we have and Calcolithic. All right, so I'll wind down there and um, ask for any questions. Peter, I think you're muted. keep muting myself when you guys speak and forgetting to unmute. Um, I wanted to know if, uh, since you're working in uh, Georgia, we talked about how little uh, um, Upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic uh, DNA samples there are from Armenia. Are there any from Georgia in the region where you're working? Yeah, there are. And they're actually very important samples. Unfortunately, as of now, there are no Upper Paleolithic or even epipaleolithic or mesolithic samples from Armenia or anywhere else. But in Georgia, there are two very important ones, a, a late upper paleolithic sample and a mesolithic sample from two sites in Imereti, which is in central Georgia. Um, the sites are called Satsurblia and Cotias Kilde. And both of these, both of these upper paleolithic and mesolithic samples yielded a J, uh, Y chromosome J haplogroup. And that was a surprise to a lot of us because J is associated, J1 and J2 are associated very strongly with the Levant, the Arabian Peninsula, um, and other parts of the Near East to the South, but they also are present in large quantities in Dagestan and Chechnya. So it was a surprise to see them in, in Paleolithic and Mesolithic Georgia. Uh, okay. So. But unfortunately, that's that's all we have for Paleolithic in in the region. Hopefully, some more. Uh, yeah. will, will come. Uh, just interesting on a personal level that I'm I'm a J1 variety also that you find a lot in uh, uh, northern Caucasus and and yeah. even more strangely, uh, one of my business partners who just passed away um, a month ago is a Coptic Christian from Egypt and uh, he belongs to the same little group from which um the uh, one of your samples uh, uh is uh, when we did a y um, a full uh, sequencing of his uh, y chromosome and he, he he belongs to that same uh, uh group uh a total outlier in j1 as the sample in, in one of the samples in georgia we can talk about it later you and yeah, I. Please. <laughs> I don't know how he found his way to uh <laughs> to egypt uh, yeah. from from um Voila. So um, that's that was one question. Uh, another question. Uh, so we we um, we're talking. I mean, the Armenian language here. Uh, it's it's. Uh, you you say that there's a lot of evidence that uh, uh, Indo-European languages from uh, Anatolia um, probably developed in uh, the Anatolian region because you, we don't find any genetic evidence of uh, a step admixture. Um, but what about the Armenian language itself? Uh, uh, is it related to these, um, to these Anatolian languages or as you say, no. close to Greek? So, so, yeah. uh, if, so the, the Proto-Armenian, Proto-Indo-European language from which it came may have started in, uh, in Western Asia, Anatolia had gone up to the Yamnaya region and then came back. Uh, well, I think I think the the preponderance of evidence now, and this is so. Let me back up and say that this was this is the thing that was beguiling to to researchers like J.P. Mallory, 
because Armenian didn't fit into the category of Anatolian Indo-European languages, meaning it's not related in any close way to Hittite um, or to Luvian or the one, you know, these languages that have um, in, in inscription corpuses. So nobody knew where to put it. So it was Mallory's idea that it evolved next to Greek because the you know, let's say in genealogical terms that Greek and Armenian, certainly not mutually intelligible, but so you could say that they're at the second or third cousin, they have that kind of status. So it's as close as you get, that's as close as Armenian gets to anything. Um, so Mallory assumed that Greek had evolved in more or less in situ in Southeastern Europe, Thrace, Marmara, and so on. And so he put Armenians um, evolution there as well. But Eric Hamp is saying instead that both Greek and Armenian co-evolved on the northeastern shores of the Black Sea and made their way gradually into Anatolia and finally into the to their present positions. So that's the distinction. Indo-European, proto-Indo-European evolved on the steppe. Really, okay. nobody argues about that because of its relationship to Uralic languages. But the Anatolian Indo-European languages themselves um, seem to have seem to have diversified in Anatolia. Okay, so so follow up on following up on this and something Arsen said also. <clears throat> so do you think that um, the um, it may have been a small group of people, an elite, for example? who introduced the language to an otherwise uh, very mixed uh, population uh, uh, who spoke probably other languages, be they uh, Indo-European or extinct Anatolian or uh, uh, or uh, the other types of Caucasian languages? Something like that. It, of course, we don't even know what the linguistic landscape of the ancient Caucasus was. I think it would be too much to assume that it looked like more or less like it does now with Georgian and Georgia. I mean, who knows? Yeah. But, you know, there are ancient languages that are that were known to be spoken in the area that are basically isolates and don't even have demonstrable connections to the Caucasian uh, family. It's, and it's really, and even there, Caucasian is not one family, it's three families. Yeah. So the, the, lang the, the landscape itself, it's impossible to, to, to um, speculate on specific scenarios, but I tend to think that when you have the emergence of a dominant language in a region, that you have to have some other kind of social domination go along with that, you know, whether it's some kind of military thing or an economic thing. I mean, look at Turkey now, you know, the, how did that happen? You can take the example of Hungary also, where the, Hungary. Magyars, the Magyars, the people who came right. and brought their language, but they have practically uh, no trace in the genetic record, except when they you dig in royal tombs or uh, yeah. whatever. It's really in a super elite in that case. Okay. Yeah. Hungary is a great example. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, in, you, you talked about the Carnot samples here. How come there was only one? Uh, uh, you were only able to extract, was it because the, the other uh, samples were female or? Uh, the... Great question. Um, some of the samples were female, of course, but what's important to understand is that with ancient DNA, of course, it's organic material. So the degradation process begins immediately after death of the individual. DNA that's preserved in cool, dry places lasts longer. So you, that's why, for example, researchers in Siberia were able to glean almost a full genome from the Denisovan, from the individuals in the Denisovan cave from a yeah. finger bone, which otherwise is un, almost unthinkable. Uh, it's because it was cool and dry. Whereas if you're trying to do genetic research on ancient individuals from a place like Sri Lanka or Southeast Asia, um, you can expect the degradation to happen much faster. But we're still talking about, you know, four and a half, five thousand years, even though the Caucasus is fairly cool and dry, re relatively. Um, the, but, and, and so on, on top of that, Y chromosome DNA uh, just doesn't, it's, it's just harder to put back together um, in the ancient, from ancient context. Mitochondrial DNA 
is <clears throat> is more abundant and easier to piece back together. So we only got one Y chromosome haplogroup from that whole cohort of samples. There are other ancient Y chromosome haplogroups, you know, haplotype individuals, but that was the only one from Carnot, unfortunately. Okay. All right. Um, one last question then. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, whenever I was talking about the results of the makeup of the uh, living Armenians in the Armenian DNA project, uh, I was coming up with some uh, uh, haplogroup distributions and mtDNA distributions, uh, which looked very similar. This gets back to a question Arsene was saying, uh, very similar to uh, populations uh, like Assyrians, uh, Chaldeans. Uh, yeah. Um, Jews of Kurdistan and Iraq, so the, the same type of uh, haplogroup, haplogroup distributions. Uh, do you think that uh, the modern Armenian DNA um, <coughs> is similar to the ancient DNA of the people who lived in the Armenian plateau? Are we as a people um, um, similar to the Bronze Age inhabitants uh, of the Armenian plateau, or do you see uh, changes? Uh, yeah, the, the well so ch changes sure, but um, it, it's important, you know. So for those of you who remember the genetic study by um, Herrera at all, 2012, this revealed that Armenian Y chromosome haplotypes were really tightly structured and more closely related to their neighbors, certainly than to anyone else in the Balkans. Um, but had had, um, and then this paper was followed up by. Um, some subsequent research which demonstrated that there's really a direct line from the, the Bronze Age of the Armenian highlands to the present. Okay, so that's, you know, that's something that's something we can say for sure. But it's always important to remember that, you know, no one, no one out there, not even a not even a community isolated in the Amazon rainforest is genetically unrelated to its neighbors. Everybody's related to their neighbors. Whether they're whether they now speak different languages, whether they now are at war, doesn't matter what. Everyone is related to their the neighbors on the landscape. Yeah, exactly, and that's valid for uh, Armenians and uh, uh, Azeris and Turks from Eastern Turkey, clearly. But but some of these papers also, uh, as as you mentioned, uh, showed that the the current Armenians have uh, are pr practically the same. Uh, mix as the Bronze Age uh, uh, populations who were living there. And it, the only other place where they found uh, so much uh, homogeneity was the, in, the, in the highlands of uh, Sardinia. But everywhere else in Europe, uh, there were waves upon waves upon waves of people who basically changed the genetic landscape. Whenever you look at ancient DNA, you find very different uh, people in the past than the people who are actually living there right now. I think with this, we can... Include the panel discussion. Thank you so much, all of you, for your uh, contributions. Uh, I think there's a bit of an echo here. We'll open the floor to uh, not. To, I will read some of the questions that came through here. Um, there was a question regarding uh, Caucasian hunter gatherers. We talked about European hunter gatherers, uh, EHG, and Caucasian hunt hunter gatherers. Sorry. I keep tripping on this one. Um, what is the uh, geographic uh, uh, confines of this uh, CHG group? Are we talking uh, north and south of the Caucasus or South Caucasus? Um, so these are people who were living uh, before the advent of farming, uh, hunt, hunter gatherer communities um, in the Caucasus. We know also uh, that um, there was a bit of an ice age. Uh, I, I remind me that um, when it took place, but uh, the whole Caucasus was quite cold and full of glaciers and uninhabitable for some point in time also. So if if one, some of you can shed some light on uh, the, the CHG, we would I would appreciate it. Sure. The and, and to your point about the last glacial maximum that occurred about 20,000 years ago. And it's actually a, it's a good question as to whether and how ancient peoples in the Caucasus survived in river valleys, you know, in warmer places um, through that period. Certainly it was possible to do, um, but it's, it's sort of uncertain 
which genetic um, lineages or what proportion of the heritage of present day Caucasus can be traced to pre glacial maximum. That's a whole different question. But for so about CHG, Caucasus hunter gatherers, that is a genetic cluster. It's not as it's not a what it is what these clusters like CHG and EHG are not are are clusters of haplogroups, meaning it's not all they're not all G2A, they're not all J2, something like that. Um, there are there are a variety of haplogroups that are associated with these genetic clusters because these clusters are established by looking at um, the whole genome. So these are. These are genetic clusters which appear to have a signature that's associable with a particular geographic locale and probably through the process of genetic drift, um, which means, you know, sort of random changes over time um, have come to have a, a uniqueness, but I would stress that it's, again, not a, um, not unique to the point where we're saying that there are there's no relationship to neighbors. That's never the case. Okay, thank you. That had been a question from Marc Abagian. Um, we have a question from uh, Arda Ekmekci regarding burial practices. She says that Urartian sites uh, practice, practice both cremation and inhumation. So um, is that an indication of mixed population or not necessarily? It could be a difference between mm -hmm. elite and, uh, yeah. yeah, perhaps I can uh, answer to this question. Actually, uh, cremation is typical for the elite, Urartian elite, and inhumations are typical for the people. But in reality, if we take into consideration the the quantity of Urartian burials, real burials, most of them if we are really um, sure that they are Urartian, most of them are cremations. And those inhumations, which we consider as to be Urartian, for example, the Karmir Balur, which is very often mentioned in the uh, text of the article, the most of them are the burials of local people. They have nothing to do with the elite Urartian grave. And all of most of them are dating to the pre-Urartian period, or they are dating to the period of Urartu, but representing totally different cultural context than the Urartian. Sometimes bearing Urartian objects, but not directly connected to the Urartian elite culture itself. This is the biggest problem in investigation of Urartian burial rite. But the most of the uh, burials which we know they belong to Urartu, they are belonging mostly to the elite. And this is a, I think this is more, more social problem than, than an ethnic problem. And uh, the first uh, cremations appear are appearing in Armenia or in the Caucasus, in the southern Caucasus on the whole, during just at the end of the Middle Bronze, at the beginning of the Middle Bronze Age, end of the uh, of the early Bronze Age, just in the in this period of this great change, and very, very often they are connected with Indo-Europeans in the scientific literature but here we have something which we cannot connect to each other the elite being it indo-european or hurian or urartian they are very often uh, demonstrating themselves in a similar way and this is more a social context has a social background than an ethnic okay Thank you very much, Arsen. Uh, we have uh, Haraj Matirosyan who would like to intervene uh, because he's a linguist and he has some comments to make on uh, the relationship between Armenian and Anatolian and Armenian and Greek. So um, is it okay with you uh, if he can uh, intervene directly instead of me relaying the question? Go ahead, Haraj. 
Thank you. Many thanks for, for this wonderful discussion. Um, I'll just make a short commentary upon uh, the linguistic relationship between Armenian uh, and Anatolian on the one hand and Armenian and Greek on the other. Um, there are no particular linguistic isoglosses between Armenian and Anatolian. Uh, so uh, they, they are, uh, we could even say that uh, they are the farthest uh, branches. So uh, there are some interesting um, uh, linguistic features shared by these two branches, but they are archaisms, certainly. So they are inherited from the uh, archaic layers. So uh, in this level, we should um, rely upon shared innovations which took place right uh, in, in the period of uh, the dispersal of Indo-European. And at this level, um, we have um, uh, means to uh, speak about the Armenian, Greek, and Indo-Iranian uh, dialectal union. And sometimes also Phrygian, Thracian, and Albanian can come around, but uh, so the study of these branches are um, notoriously not so easy. So we basically speak about Armenian, Greek, and Indo-Iranian. Uh, so uh, on the other hand, this uh, Ar uh, Armenian-Greek uh, uh, very close relationship is uh, um, exaggerated, certainly, uh, as uh, Eric, uh, so I mean, in terms of Eric Hemp, uh, so that we can speak uh, about uh, Hel armeno hellenic branch, uh, we don't see uh, any serious ba basis on this. Uh, it's really exaggerated. There are a lot of Armenian Greek in, uh, so uh, isolated uh, linguistic features, but they are late. So this is very important methodologically, because if we are talking about the um, uh, relevant isoglosses, then it's not only Armenian Greek, but Armenian Greek and Indo-Iranian, one large dialectal union. Uh, because after the dispersal, when Indo-Iranians move uh, eastwards, then Armenians and Greek uh, Greeks were um, left in the same uh, neighborhood uh, environment. And uh, by the way, I also think that uh, Proto-Armenians did not move to Balkans. So they penetrated through the Caucasus. And uh, uh, the relationship between Proto-Armenian and Proto-Greek must have uh, taken place somewhere. Uh, it's not uh, easy to um, uh, localize uh, very uh, very precisely, of course, but uh, somewhere uh, to uh, north to Co Caucasus or uh, on the northern uh, Black Sea um, shores. Uh, so so this so this is it. So uh, Armenian and Anatolian, it's there is no particular relationship. So we can talk about Armeno Greek or uh, Indo Iranian dialectal union. Uh, and uh, one last uh, clarification. Uh, indeed, there are uh, many more uh, Armenian and Greek um, uh, linguistic features, uh, mostly lexical, but as I said, the, they belong to later periods. So they, they share a lot of interesting things with the common substrate and uh, uh, not only after uh, dispersal, but uh, even at the uh, consequent, um, at the much later periods. Uh, so this does not belong already to Indo-European world. So uh, this is why I'm saying that it's not one branch Armenian and Greek, but uh, dialectal union was uh, larger and Armenian Greek developed uh, a lot of things later. So thank you. Thank you very much, Raj. Uh, very interesting. I think your comments basically uh go completely in the direction of what the papers uh, and the genetics uh, is showing also yeah. about an origin uh, in the Yamnaya uh, yeah. culture in uh, Ukraine and, and moving down separate ways. It's exactly uh, um, what we were talking about uh, previously and what Armen uh, was talking about. Thank you. Uh, Thank we you. have a question to um, Arsene regarding uh, when you talk about, uh, you mentioned that uh, there were samples in Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, somebody wants to know uh, who was tested in Azerbaijan and if there's any genetic uh, uh, studies of Azeri people, if it's permitted there or not, uh, or are we talking about the uh, Iranian province of Azerbaijan? So, um, Arsene, do you have uh, any comments? This is Robin Galician. Thank you. I uh, now, to what I know, the materials are used from the Republic of Azerbaijan, not from Iranian Azerbaijan. Okay. So the materials should be, I have no so detailed information about it. The genetics, maybe uh, 
uh, could under, could reply to this question better. But to what now the the materials were analyzed more by international archaeologists working in Azerbaijan uh, and not uh, Azeri archaeologists that we have here, we have in Azerbaijan a big project. European Azeri project, the so-called Kura project, which was realized by um, German and uh, French archaeologists today, together with Azeri archaeologists, they should have taken these uh, materials to analyze to what I know, but I have no detailed information about it. Armen, do you have any information on that? Uh, to, to, to follow up, yes, the first of all, it's not illegal to do genetic studies in Azerbaijan. It's just there just aren't very many. There was an, you know there was an, there are studies from the 1990s by Ivan Nasidze. Unfortunately, those studies are at far too low a resolution for them to be useful today, but the data is out there. Um, and the other perhaps obvious point is that the, the samples in question were ancient not modern and it's it sounds like there may have been some confusion there but the um and you know it, it's it, you can there is it's possible to take ancient samples out of azerbaijan and that's what was done okay all right um and i think the last question we have from people uh who in the chat room was uh whether there's an uh, from armine lulejian have there been efforts to write an opinion piece or a response uh, on as a critique to these papers? Um, so uh, I leave it to you uh, to answer this. Um, I, maybe you can talk about the process of what goes on when academic papers are published and whether there are uh, official responses to them. Um, outside of the uh, newspaper articles? Uh, if I may, there, there has been one response uh, and one sort of a review slash comment on the article by Benjamin Arbuckle, and I don't remember his co-author's name, uh, my apologies, but, um, uh, and it's it doesn't address some of the uh, points that Arsen brought up, some of the problematic uh, points like terminology and uh, mixing of uh, pots and people, ethnicity, linguistics, genetics, and things like that, uh, but there has been a response. Um, uh, and some of the things that were brought up um, did kind of cross over a little bit with what Arsen was saying, found with um, some of the co-authors, even though our names are on the paper. Uh, we don't all agree on some of the interpretive um, uh, narratives of the of the paper, and um, so that's it has been addressed. Um. Mm -hmm. Well, good. So, uh, if, if for me, uh, I mean, it, it 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 should end my my intervention as moderator. I'm, uh, all I can say is that the the papers are fascinating. They're opening a, a lot of very interesting leads. It's just the beginning. Uh, more is to come um, because uh, people are working really hard and putting a lot of resources in uh, in increasing the database. So as as things uh, move forward and as more people are brought into the discussion, um, I think we can look forward to a lot of very uh, uh, intellectually stimulating and fascinating data coming in the future to shed light on. Uh, uh, our distant, distant origins. Thank right. you, Agar. For thank you very much, Peter, and thank you for the panelists, and also thank you, Haraj, for your comments. <laughs> uh, this was a fascinating discussion, and I think it will be good to uh, to learn more about what's going on in the in the field. Uh, just a reminder that we are going to have another uh, panel discussion on July 22nd, and the subject will be scientific research and development in Armenia and the academic city. Actually, the government uh, lately announced a new idea 
of developing a, a new, completely new academic city, they call it. And it's not clear as to what it involves yet, but uh, there's a lot of discussion going on already. And we are bringing experts to discuss it. And two of the experts were actually uh, co-authors of a published uh, report that was commissioned by the European Union, uh, which uh, studied essentially all the scientific community and the research facilities in Armenia, and they made their recommendations, which one of them was actually to form a completely new institution. So um, two of them are Alistair Reed and Göran Melin. Uh, these were experts from the European Union. And then Aram Pakchanyan and Tigran Shahverdian are experts from Armenia who will uh, essentially talk about the rebuttal or discussion of the pros and cons. The moderation will be uh, Dr. Mary Papazian. So you're, you'll all be invited, of course. And now if we don't have your email addresses, please put them on the chat or send them to info info at arpainstitute.org and we will send you the emails in the future. Thank you very much and hope to see you again next time. Thank Goodbye. you everyone. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.